Hello, my name is Joel Kirk. I am the Artistic Director and Founder of Discovering Broadway. Welcome to today's interview with Broadway's Megan Hilty. You know her from Wicked, 9 to 5, Noises Off, and NBC's Smash. So I'm, I'm actually going to start not only from the beginning, but a little before the beginning. I, I heard a story about your mom reading a book that instructed her not to sing uh, to you growing up because she, she was tone deaf and that she would just pass it on to you if she was singing to you. So even before you were born, there were concerns about how it would affect your vocal talent. And I got to say, great job, mom. That's really <laughs> she crushed it. Who knows if it's actually true, but my mom did read this article. It was um, about this Japanese study that was done uh, about tone deaf mothers singing to their children, and it warned against doing it. So she just never did. I still have never, she's never sung to me. I have no idea what she's doing. She's like still that. concerned. She's still a little like, you know, you never know. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but, but instead of that, uh, she and my dad played me all kinds of different music growing up like the music man uh, manhattan transfer um uh, all types of like motown and uh dolly parton whitney houston you know like all kinds of different things and, and how crazy was it to like listen to dolly parton growing up and then be like oh i'm gonna play this and get to know dolly never, i mean never in my wildest dreams would i have ever thought that but it was so perfect. That's the other, that's like the annoying thing. It's like, it was, it's like, no, you were actually made to do this. And it was so, I remember actually someone was playing the score at an event a couple of years ago, but I thought we were listening to Dolly Parton. And I was like, yeah, Dolly's got it. It's like, this isn't Dolly. <laughs> this is like, it's like, it's And uh, um, also Music Man, every time I revisit that show, I'm reminded that it's probably one of the best musicals ever written. That like yeah. to, to yeah. just open with a patter, essentially rap song. Um, yeah. The fact that one of the songs like comes out of the scene of a piano lesson so perfectly, and that Marion's song is Harold Hill's song in a different time signature. What yeah. the what? Yeah. No, it is. It's a. It's a wonderful. That score is so beautiful. <sighs> Have you played Marion? No, nobody will even let me audition for a soprano role, which is so crazy to me because that's what? like what I am at my heart. Like that's, <laughs> that's like what I've always viewed myself as. And, um, and everybody's like, no, you're not, you're a belter. And I'm like, ah. I kind of, I learned that so that I could get some jobs because I realized that not many sopranos, you know, they weren't really writing for sopranos that much at the time that I was graduating college. So I was like, ah, I should probably learn how to belt if I want to get some jobs. <laughs> Isn't that so interesting that like when these programs are, they're doing their best to figure out how do we prepare all of our students for success. I know you went to Carnegie Mellon. Um, and so one of the things is if you come in and you are an amazing belter, they're like, let's also teach you classical. Or if you're classically trained, they're like, all right, we're also going to teach you how to belt. But it's like you, one of the things I've heard you talk a lot about is, uh, I'm jumping around a little bit here with smash when your manager like sent you what they were looking for you were like oh it says dance tell them thank you oh. <laughs> we appreciate oh. it thank you i yeah because i am not a dancer and i have i've been through so many horrible dance calls um and it's just the most mortifying thing and knowing the people attached to smash i was like i'm not i'm not going to literally and metaphorically fall on my face uh, in front of all of these people, <laughs> these, these fancy, fancy people. I would rather just wait and audition for like some kind of uh, guest starring role when this becomes a huge hit. So, so then what happened when you're like, I, I don't think so. Were they like, no, we really, we really think you should go out for it. I mean, did you, who are your like inner my manager, circle? Yeah, my manager was like, Oh, it'll all figure itself out. Just, and she really was like, just go in an audition and we'll figure out the rest. And they did it. That's, you know, uh, yeah. The, thank goodness Josh Burgos is the genius that he is because he oh he made it look like I was a dancer. Um, and and the um, how they filmed it too, like his between his choreography and how they filmed it, they really tricked a lot of people. <laughs> uh, so that 
people like ask me to come do dancing roles and I'm like, I am not your girl. Like I'm not, I don't do that. But I also, I love how confidently you um, can say that because I feel like a lesson that's really helpful for people to learn without limiting themselves is finding out, okay, where do I disqualify um, so that I can really put a lot of energy and force into some of the, you know, some people will go to an audition and be like, what am I doing here? Yeah, well, I, I think it's really important to be honest with yourself about what, what it is that you're selling. Like, <laughs> right. what it, what, what's this product that you're, that you're pushing? Um, and, uh, I, I think it's important to be aware of limitations. Uh, and with that awareness comes being aware of how much you can push them. I feel like it depends on the circumstance, whether or not you think, well, I'm not a dancer, but maybe I can get away with this, or maybe if I just see how far I can go with this, if they'll make a, you, you know, and that's, that's what ended up happening with Smash. I think at the end of the day, people really just want whoever's best for the character. And then, and then if they have the, person who's the most honestly that character then, right. then they, they, there's wiggle room to to kind of work around any shortcomings right <laughs> right can you talk a little bit about the smash audition process is it is it a little bit meta to talk about smash and the process of making smash like i remember hearing a story where you guys are filming in times square and there's a billboard of you in times right. square and yeah, the, the DP's like, we can't <laughs> film it. We get, we gotta <laughs> get the angles yeah. right. I mean, it was it was kind of crazy because I I was living in LA and I saw it was pilot season and I saw the the script and I thought, well, how crazy is this? That uh, there's a TV show about like my world, and my life. Like I know these people. I know who these characters are in my life. You know, like right. I went in, read for it, and uh, they also they asked me to sing a song and I had. Um, in the couple of years that I'd been pounding the pavement in LA, um, trying to get TV and animation work, um, I had to develop a show to kind of, kind of pay my bills, you know? Um, so I had this, like Megan Hilty sings the blondes show. That was all like material that was written or made famous by blonde people. And, um, so I had this little medley all ready to go from Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. And so I sang Bye Bye Baby from, from Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. And then they had me sing uh, Happy Birthday to You to the camera as Marilyn, which is mortifying. <laughs> uh, and no, I won't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Dang it. No, I won't. What's so different, obviously, about Smash is the rehearsal process is way longer because you're, you're learning dances, you're learning staged moments that are in the show the again that meta like recording of theater about a show about theater um how how does this is a, a theme that obviously can go back to you know your days in wicked or your days in college or how you maintain it now how do you take care of the artist instrument essence that is you when you're when you're working that 24 7 um well that that particular show was really taxing in that, um, I mean, TV is notoriously kind of slow, right? So while so there's normally a lot of downtime in between shots while they're setting up the next shot with the camera and the lighting and everything, getting all of that right, and the actor normally has a bunch of downtime. Uh, not the case in this show. We were always like rehearsing something in our downtime. We were learning some kind of song or going to the recording studio or in these epic uh, costume fittings. I mean, the wardrobe for that was so beautiful. Um, so there was all, there was never a dull moment. Right. Um, but I loved it. I was, I was also really young. I was like eight years younger then, you know, um, and not married no kids, you know, so I was able to like really throw myself into it, but I did have two dogs, you know, so, um, so I had responsibility outside of that. That's something that I always come back to. Um, I was getting so wrapped up in work. It, it forced me to care about something else, right. you know, and, um, and 
once I got them, I experienced love in a whole different way than I had known before. Right. You know, um, which and that I can bring to my love scenes. You know what I mean? Like I can all of that life experience enriches what you bring to your work. So I, I think it's really, really, really important to have other things outside of whatever it is you're working on that makes you a person. <laughs> right, right. Um, Do you yeah. find, and I know, you know, the stars don't always align every day. Everybody has a bad day. Everybody's going through some stress. But do you find that you do your best work when you're joyful? After nine to five, uh, I closed. It was it was a big heartbreak because even though we we were only on Broadway for maybe four months, I did all the readings and workshops. So by the end of it, I had uh, worked on the show for about three years. Um, so it was a it was a massive heartbreak, and the way that it ended made me bitter and angry. I was mm. upset at Broadway, at New York. I was upset at politics, you know, all of these things. Yep. And so at the end of it, I really had to ask myself what I should be doing because I knew I couldn't stay in New York because any audition room I walked into, they would be able to smell the anger oh. <laughs> on me. I just didn't like that. I didn't like who I was. So like in that scenario. So I decided with no promise of any job or a home, even like any, I didn't have nothing out in LA, but I knew that I was happier out in LA because I'd been here with, with uh, Wicked before that. And, um, and I thought, you know what? I might never work again, but at least I'll be happy in the sunshine. And I'll really focus all of my energy into trying to get into television and animation. Yeah. And, uh, and even if it doesn't work out, you know, I'll, I'll just, I'll figure it out, but at least I'm, I'm, I, that's where I know that I'm happy and I, I need that right. for me. I don't know. It's been a while since I've done a Broadway show. The last one was Noises Off and, um, and that was extremely taxing, uh, mentally and physically. My God. Yeah, it was. It was a, it was a lot. And I, I had a one-year-old on top of it, you know, so it was, that was crazy pants. Also referring to what you're talking about, like taking the time to get ready. Both of them are about taking a moment mm. for yourself and however that works for you to kind of ground you, let you breathe a little bit, relax. So I have a a three-year-old and a five-year-old. They get up at 5.30 every day. They go to bed at between 7 and 7.30 every day. And there's, there's no downtime. Each of us gets a part of the morning. Like I get a good 45 minutes, sometimes an hour, where I'll go for a run. I'll come back and take a shower and put myself together and listen to, I have a podcast. I, I listen to the New York Times, the daily, every morning so that I know what's going on. No husband no kids. It's just mine for mm. that portion of the day. Mm. And just having that, wow. even sometimes it's like 20 minutes. Sometimes yeah. if it has to be 20 minutes, 20 minutes is fine. But just having that one part of the day, whether you meditate, whether you listen to a book on tape, whether, whatever your thing is, whether it's putting on your makeup, you right. know, like it's your time to, to find something that centers you every day and, calm you down um and on broadway it, it's you've got to be hydrating and sleeping as much as you can well and for people who don't know noises off is basically a three-hour marathon um that is yeah. all about timing precision muscle energy there's no like marking noises off <laughs> was uh, the, you're doing this different version of the same things, oh, like three different versions of the same things within one. And the cues while you're backstage to open the doors vary slightly within. The tricky part is when you have two shows in one day. So you're standing there 
and you're like, wait, I feel like I've done this already. Which act are we in? Oh my gosh, which will line am I waiting for? Do you know, like, it, that's what was really hard because your mind cannot wander at all. <laughs> it, was, it was crazy. I, so right out of college, you booked uh, Understudy for Glinda, and then they gave it to you. And this was, what people need to remember is 2004, five, maybe? Four. Four. Wicked, obviously, is still a huge deal. But get rid of Hamilton, get rid of Book of Mormon, get rid of all the huge hits that you've had in the past two decades. Wicked was it. It was the thing. That was the role. Everybody wanted, you know. I I think I, I remember hearing you tell a story about, like, there's a fight wand. And they switched out the wands, and maybe it was lighter or something. And you're twirling it on stage, and before you know, you look down at your hand, and it is, like, in the aisle of the audience. <laughs> I, in my twirling of it, because I hadn't practiced with this particular one, they were trying out new designs. And it was it was in the audience. I, I could have <laughs> really hurt somebody, but it landed in the aisle and it stopped the show. And some nice man came and brought it to me. And <clears throat> what was um, like a favorite memory from from your time doing Glinda? There's so many. I mean, I've spent four and a half years with the show. I also love Just, that you I, said. You spent four and a half years in that role because most millennials will not spend four and a half years in a job. <laughs> like, just think about that. Millennials <laughs> change it's like eight yeah. times between twenty one and like thirty four. That's that's called uh, longevity. Most actors won't won't stay in a role for that long. Right. I mean, like it. That's a long. It's a long time. But I think the best part was was getting to. Um make such good friends with such remarkable women mm -hmm. like all of them just hands down some of the greatest people I've ever met and I got to work with them very very closely every night I mean like doing that show with with another person is is uh it's it's intense and you feel like you've gone through through something and feeling I guess and feeling like I was a part of something that changed people's minds you know like I I knew that every night somebody left that theater thinking of the world differently, you know, like thinking, thinking twice about like how they treated somebody else or something like that, you know, uh, feeling, feeling like you're a part of something that affects people like that is incredible. You observed in some of the people you admired longevity in performing because of career diversification and I think it's so fascinating. I'd love for you to talk about how you went about thinking about career diversification. Because uh, it's one thing to think about a solution. You know, that's probably the easy part. Then actually getting there and being on now 30 shows um, is a whole other thing. Where did you start? And once Wicked took me out to Los Angeles and I started kind of getting my first like TV jobs, the little, little things here and there, I thought, well, this is really great. Um, that's what really got me started thinking about like, okay, well, where do I want my career to go? Like, what do I want to do? And, uh, I looked to the people whose careers I wanted to emulate. Like they were not just theater people. They worked in film, television, uh, concerts, voiceovers, everything. And, um, and so I thought to myself, and that's also really appealing to me to not just do one thing. Because uh, you're able to do all of these things at the same time, for the most part. Um, jumping into a field that I was not initially comfortable with really pushed me out of my comfort zone and, and made me better in other areas. Like, you know, like, um, I, I assume another important thing about longevity in a career is having a rich community of people you really like being around and going to with. One, just friendship, but problems or questions or, you know, your go-to people. Um, who, who are your, like, best friends? Uh, well, my best friend is Carly Hughes. She's been in a million Broadway shows. I think she's been in, like, 12 Broadway shows. Um, and right now she's in American Housewife um, on ABC. ABC. Um, and uh, she lives down the street. And, so um, awesome. We basically, like, quarantine together. Right. You know, from the beginning, she's uh, she lives by herself, and and she's extremely close with. Yeah, she is one of my best friends. I mean, like Eden Espinosa, Elise Henderson, you know, like um, Stephanie Block. I mean, like all of these, like Jesse Mueller. I mean, like all of these, like 
super powerhouse, ridiculously talented women, you know, um, are my support system. There are, and without that, it would be really, really, really difficult without that. That is a game night I think a lot of people would like to pay to attend. (laughs) (laughs) A producer calls you and says, all right, I want to do whatever next project you want to do with whoever you want to do it with. I've always wanted to do Gentlemen Prefer Blondes for like a proper run. Uh, I did it with Encores. We did it for a couple weeks and it just wasn't enough. It's such a brilliantly written show um, I would just love to get to do that again. Are there people who are like, man, we have somehow not been able to be on stage together, and that's got to happen. That that come to mind? You know, I've always wanted to do something with Norm Lewis. He's just like one. Of, he's just like one of the greatest people, and his voice is just golden. Um, yeah, he's he's one of those ones. That and every time we see him, we're like. Why can't we just do something? Why, why, why can't we just... Do you remember the first like TV experience and like what might, might have surprised you about that process? So for any actor who's about to do their first TV job? Yeah, the, the, the first uh, TV uh, acting job I had was um, on The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. Um, and I played Arwen's girlfriend. And it was a sitcom, but not filmed in front of an audience. Uh, in the theater, we spend all this time rehearsing, and then we get to perform. And and then we have to do it over and over and over and over again. The job is kind of keeping something fresh that you've been doing for sometimes years. In TV, uh, you just do it a couple times, and then you're done. And then you never do it again. <laughs> so it's it's kind of the opposite. Um and it's wonderful, and they feed you. Yeah. <laughs> you work. It's wonderful. So this is the most random question you'll probably ever be asked. Richard Strauss, <laughs> Electra. I hear you're a fan. Um, One of my favorite, like probably my absolute favorite opera, just just because it's really dark. I really liked how dark it was. It's also one act. Um, but do you do you remember like? experiencing that show early on and, and do a lot of your tastes like are you a Sweeney Todd fan then because you kind of like the dark or like Sweeney your Todd's own personal favorite musical I think it's a perfect perfectly written musical yeah but like does how how much does your taste dictate what projects you choose versus being like actually you know, this is this is one that I want for this is a good paycheck but they're also not just like offers like I work really hard to get auditions and then I have to like right. that some things I won't even put myself in consideration for because I don't think it's something my kids would be entirely proud of me doing at an age of their life. So that's kind of changed. Is there any bad piece of advice that you think is like commonly thrown around? Like I, I taught a master class at, I think it was at CMU and this girl came in wibble wobbling on her high heels. And I was like, are you comfortable in those? And she was like, no, but the person who came and taught us before said, I'm a girl, so I have to be in high heels. And I was like, if that's not you, just because you're a girl doesn't mean that you wear heels. Some girls love and wear heels all the time, and that's who they are, and that's the characters they play. Those people should be wearing heels. If you are not comfortable in them, you are not going to play a character that wears heels you don't have to wear them just because you're a girl. You know, like, I, that goes against who you are inherently and, and what it is that that you'll end up playing. Um, so I, I just think it, that bad advice is something that, that goes against your nature. What would be, like, great advice that you received? Um, maybe even in your time at Carnegie Mellon, which is a school, you know, a lot of kids want to get into and many, many apply for <laughs> Just understand that what you bring to the table is good enough. You can't guess what people want or are looking for and try to do that. That that ends in disappointment. <laughs> um, but what, what you can do is be super honest with yourself about who you are, what you bring to the table, um, 
and be totally secure in the fact that that's good enough. Whether it gets you the job or not is inconsequential because you, you will never have any idea their criteria. Right. So to get it and try to fit yourself into whatever mold that you think that they want, it, it doesn't do anybody any favors. Who were the people you were looking up to? Because now I, all these kids are looking up to you. So who were your inspiration? Uh, well, Bernadette Peters was always a huge one. Um, and she still is, you know. Uh, knowing now that she's an incredible person, so kind, so generous on top of her insane, iconic talent, you know, and singular talent, really, um, just makes her even more of a star in my eyes. She's, she's just the greatest. I, I still, like... I clam up every time I get an email from her and I'm like, Oh, what do I say? I don't know what I do. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then uh, our last question is what, um, and this, this question certainly is colored a little bit differently given the like moment we're all in right now. But, um, what in a general sense gives you hope? Because I think something we're all learning right now is because we don't have, dates for when the world comes back or dates that make any of us feel like yep that's definitely it what's actually happening is we're losing hope in some some of the information we get so we're just kind of feeling like we're in the dark with a flashlight and and just wishing instead of hoping um and that hope is an essential thing to to humanity but in a career that has so many unknowns it's probably just all unknowns um that is theater um, hope is a really useful tool. And we talked a little bit about community and being able to lean on those people. But now, um, given where you are in this stage of your career, in this stage of life, what are some things that, you know, give you life and give you hope? N nothing is guaranteed. Ever. Everything can always change in a heartbeat. Always. This will change too. And this will pass. And we will all be back at it it will look differently, but maybe for the better. Maybe that maybe this is a chance for um, for everyone to take pause and reinvent themselves. And I it I don't know if I call it hope, but I am I find a deep comfort in that. That this is actually we could we could look at this as a, a pit that we're never going to get out of, or we can. We can choose to look at this as uh, as a, a, a new opportunity to change, and um, yeah, I, I I think it's going to be really hard for a long time, but really beautiful things come out of hard times. So I guess that's what makes me hopeful. You look at any of the um, like the the Great Depression, any of the recessions, anything, any time after war i mean the arts flourish afterwards we may not make the most money but they need us they need us they need storytellers they need artists they need um they need songs everybody that's what connects us all so right. it's not going to go away but it, it might look a little different and it might be for the better yeah one of my favorite lyrics is from the song goodbye road and it says Sometimes flowers grow from the soil of ashes. Totally. Absolutely. And I think we're going to have a lot of really beautiful flowers, maybe just a gorgeous garden after this. It might, it might be really hard to get there, but I really feel like that's at the end. 